Woman dies after Edmonton police release spike belt and she drives over it. 3,000 workers walk off the job at Toronto's York University. A new bill aimed at addressing online harms is unveiled. Ottawa launches a pathway program for thousands of Sudanese escaping war, but is it enough? And the U.S. airman who set himself on fire in protest at the genocide in Gaza has died. Good morning. It's Tuesday, February 27th. I'm Nora. Here are your headlines. We start this morning in Edmonton, where Cassandra Gartner was killed by a U-Haul truck. But it wasn't just an ordinary hit and run. She was outside of her vehicle at the moment she was hit because she had just run over a police-thrown spike belt. You'll remember me talking about spike belts on the Daily News podcast before, how they're dangerous and how they tend to cause more harm than they help. Well, here is what happened. Cops were chasing someone who they suspected of theft, which who the hell cares about theft? But anyway, they chased after this person and the person fled, quote, at a high rate of speed, reports Nishat Chowdhury from CBC News. Naturally, rather than figuring out ways to find the individual, the police chased after them. The reporting here doesn't make a ton of sense. The U-Haul hit an RCMP cruiser and then the RCMP launched the spike belt. We're supposed to read between the lines in this story, I think, and understand that the U-Haul driver was the thief. After hitting the cruiser and the belt was deployed, the U-Haul truck struck and killed Cassandra as she ran over the spike belt, got out of her car and was looking at what the heck had just happened happened. She, by the way, was the executive director of the Fort Saskatchewan Food Bank. She had three young daughters. There was another person injured as well after running over the spike belt, though they don't have life-threatening injuries. The driver of the U-Haul truck continued, crashed elsewhere at a convenience store, and then stole a Honda Civic that had a child inside. The driver ditched the kid and then drove off. The kid is fine. Cops didn't actually arrest the guy, and nor did they say anything at all about what prompted the police to engage so recklessly to try and stop the guy. Did he steal a couple of cases of beer, or did he steal 17 bars of gold? We don't know. But the cops did say this, quote, There's no indication that this individual is armed and presents an emergent risk to the community itself, unquote. Which is like, uh, then why did you do something so risky killing someone to try and catch this guy if he doesn't pose any emergent risk to the community itself you can figure out later on where he is and arrest him then it's a horrible story and again it's edmonton police Next, around 3,000 contract instructors, teaching assistants, and graduate assistants walked off the job on Monday at Toronto's York University. This after the union representing the workers, QP 3903, and the university failed to reach a new collective agreement. At issue are wages that reflect the rising cost of living and job stability. These jobs are often temporary, with contracts only lasting the length of a semester. A spokesperson for the union said that they offered to stay late on Friday to work out a deal with York, but that the university failed to respond with any proposals, even after the strike vote. The university says that it offered two proposals that address the union's demands, including a pay increase. QP 3903 members handle more than half of the classes at York. The strike means that many of those classes have been suspended. The last time that these academic workers went on strike was five years ago in 2018. That strike lasted about five months after communication between the parties broke down completely. It only ended because the province passed back to work legislation. Now to national news and news from the, quote, are you sure that's a good idea, unquote, department. The federal government has unveiled a sprawling new bill that's aimed at dealing with harmful online content. The CBC's Darren Major reports that the proposed legislation identified seven categories of online harmful content that it wants the bill to address. They include things like hate speech, sexual content that is posted without consent, and content used to bully a child. To deal with this content, Bill C-36, or the Online Harms Act, proposes new responsibilities for platforms. They include introducing or expanding tools that allow users to flag harmful content and removing flagged content within 24 hours, among other things. 
Now, platforms and social media services covered by the bill that are found to be non-compliant could face penalties of up to $10 million or 6% of their global revenues. Wow. I mean, talk about aspirational, but okay. The bill also proposes a new regulatory body to enforce new rules, along with introducing a digital safety ombudsperson to offer support to victims of online abuse. And finally, it proposes changes to sentencing around online hate, creating a new offense for carrying out a crime motivated by hate and allowing for complaints about online hate speech to be filed with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. This bill comes as there have been increased cases of sextortion involving children in Canada. Now, this is what Majors thought was notable to mention uh, from the new bill, but I haven't had a chance myself to read it yet. I did see, though, that CBC's Kate McKenna reported that they've changed the language related to inciting genocide online to make it come with a maximum sentence of life in prison, which... After what we just went through, where from the river to the sea was declared as inciting genocide, but where actually aiding and abetting genocide is apparently totally legal, I gotta say, I have some concerns. I'm gonna take a deeper dive today in this bill, and I'll do a video on my thoughts, so stay tuned to Sandy Nora's YouTube channel. Next, Ottawa is set to launch its pathway for Sudanese escaping war today. Sudan is home to the biggest displacement crisis in the world. Eight million people have been forced out of their homes since the war began last April, with many having been displaced more than once. The program the feds are launching will allow up to 3,250 Canadian citizens and permanent residents to sponsor relatives in Sudan to enter Canada. It's a similar program to the family sponsorship pathway the government has introduced for 1,000 Palestinians in Gaza. Both programs have drawn heavy criticism for the caps placed on the number of applicants and the application requirements. In this case, members of the Sudanese community have pointed out the fact that of the 3,250 people, it's not just being limited to Sudanese citizens, but includes refugees of other nationalities living in Sudan. That might be fine, except it limits the number of Sudanese who are actually able to escape. In a statement to the Globe and Mail addressing these concerns, a spokesperson for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada said this, quote, when responding to international crises, there are often similarities in that people may be fleeing instability of some sort, but the immigration responses are tailored to each different context to meet the unique needs of those who require our support, unquote. I think that's code for this is not a white country like Ukraine, and therefore we're going to limit, severely limit who is able to come to Canada. Next, a story that has dominated social media news yesterday, but it hasn't exactly been reported very much in Canadian mainstream media. A member of the U.S. Air Force who set himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington in protest of the ongoing genocide in Gaza has died. He died of his wounds. 25-year-old Aaron Bushnell live-streamed his own self-immolation on Sunday. In the video, he's seen wearing his uniform, stating that he was an active member of the United States Air Force and that he will, quote, no longer be complicit in genocide, unquote, before dousing himself in liquid. He then lit himself on fire while shouting, free Palestine. He was taken to a hospital where, sadly, he succumbed to his injuries. This is the second time since October 7th that someone has set themselves on fire in protest of the genocide in Gaza. In December, a protester carried out the same act of protest in front of the Israeli consulate in Atlanta. That protester's identity was never released. Bushnell's death brought the words of Mario Savio back to me. Savio was a student activist, and his speech, famously delivered at UC Berkeley on December 2nd, 1964, rung through my head. And here it is, quote, there is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies on the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you are free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. But I won't give Savio the last word. I'll give it to Bushnell, who wrote this in his final post. Quote, many of us like to ask ourselves, what would I do if I was alive during slavery or the Jim Crow South or apartheid? What would I do if my country was committing genocide? The answer is you're doing it right now. 
Those are your headlines for Tuesday, February 27th. I'm Nora, and yeah, it's Tuesday. So, Sandy and Nora Day. New episode drops in a couple of hours, and it's all about war. We talk about the second anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine and where things are at and why the anti war position, which was the correct position two years ago, remains the correct position today. That is, if you care about people dying. You can catch it wherever you get your podcast, just like this one, as you are listening to this podcast at sandyandnor.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and anywhere you get your podcasts. I hope you have an okay Tuesday or a good one or that you survive. And stay tuned. Sandy and Nora up soon.